Um, that was an excellent talk, and I hope it was um, stimulated a lot of discussion there. So, uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So, Evangelina uh, is joining us from the Bartlett School of Architecture, which is a little bit different. But I think when we think about these um, digital ways of training, it also changes how uh, the architectural structure might change as well. And she's also got with her one of her PhD students, Charlie Sun. And in this talk, uh, Charlie's actually going to be interviewing uh, Leah um, to get across this information. So um, welcome. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you. Just a small correction. I'm not anymore in the School of Architecture. I'm in the Real Estate Institute now. It's a very strange space for uh, a course on medical architecture, <laughs> but I, I used to be in the, in the School of Architecture, still at the Bartlett. So, um, and uh, let me start, share my PowerPoint. Share my screen. Okay, let's try to share the desktop. I hope you can, you are able to see my screen. Yes, that looks great. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so let me also minimize this. I think it will help. So this is about a digital space in hospital architecture and so I will start, I mean, this is a very interesting thing. Now, lately, when people talk about digital and architecture, they don't mean architects like me or Charlie. Uh, I mean, the, the term of architecture and digital uh, is closer to computer technology, but here we will talk about actual architecture, like buildings and uh, healthcare architecture. So which is the most famous buildings lately, which is like the epitome of healthcare architecture, I would say the Maggi centers. It's, it's like a celebrity architectural type and it's well known to us medical architects, but also to, to people in general. And here I have some Maggi centers, typical, some of the newest, some of the oldest. And uh, what I would see, they, they tend to be very avant-garde and very futuristic. Uh, and you would expect also the same appears to go with the technology inside the Maggi centers, but in fact, Maggi centers are completely low tech. So they are nothing more than a cell of a building, beautiful building, beautiful architecture, and uh, a, a very welcoming environment with a coffee table. That's the epicenter of the Maggi center and a cup of tea and biscuits. So not really much of technology going on in this area. And then at the other end, we have this type of equipment. I mean, I have a proton beam here and it's also the other end of medical architecture, one of the newest architectural uh, components. I mean, a building like that, we are uh, preparing one in UCL. So, uh, this is actually, and what we would see here, how, I mean, in fact, it's just a technological element and the architecture is there just to facilitate this building. Even, I mean, there is nothing, nothing really uh, that the environment is currently offering, just apart from being the cell and apart from being uh, providing support because some of these machines are very heavy. And then we have between these two extremes, like the almost luxurious Maggi centers and the technologically very luxurious, I mean, the, the hospitals that are privileged to have them, uh, we, we have the reality in most of the world and in, in many parts of the world. So what do we see actually here? We, we just, see a building which is just a cell. I would say 
very boring architecture, but also in, in a sense inefficient. I see a lot of cables. I see uh, cables are not only uh, places where we can have accidents, but they are also places where we can have infections. In many places, many hospitals, these, these are never disinfected. And we know that. And at the same time, the lighting is very poor. It can, uh, we know how this lighting can disrupt the melatonin of the physicians who operate in these spaces constantly. And at the same time, this space, I mean, it's not welcoming either for the patient or for the staff who work there. And I wouldn't say it's the most efficient space either. And then we have these spaces that I would say bring the two worlds together. So we see an interior that it has a lot of therapeutic elements as they know they are therapeutic in the sense, a, a lot of positive distraction for the patients and for the staff and also for the carers. It provides comfort. And of course it has a lot of more advanced technology like cordless equipment and leaves the floor clean in order to, to be more ergonomic, but also infection control. But as I said, this is wherever we can have the luxury to have this environment. And what about the theories in this? What do we have? So the main theories of, that medical architecture is using, one of our most people-friendly theories, I would say, comes from medicine. And it's the theory of salutogenesis, which in fact says that no, we can be very, very ill but we can find, we, we can have the strength to find in our environment and the elements that can support us and we can perform better. Here we, we see, for example, an athlete that has a disability, but still consider herself very active and yet very healthy. And sometimes we have, let's say, we, we consider that we are not well enough. So it's where we place ourselves in this continuum between health and illness and also how we can have our environment, how we can design our environments to support this. And th this is actually the main uh, support that medical architecture can support, the knowledge of how we can adapt the environment in order to be more therapeutic. And at the same time, I'm looking at technology and how technology can is, I mean, here I have the model of telehealth that and, uh, and e-health provision in general. And it starts from the hospital. And then it moves with the clinician in the hospital to the person's home. And then it moves completely at home with the things we can do at home to prevent and provide again a continuum of health. And I, and I was reflecting that these are very similar. And they are very similar in the sense that they consider a very holistic way of providing care from hospital to home. And also the salutogenic model, because it focuses a lot in the how we can design the environment in the hospital to support the relationship between clinician and patient, how we can support the environment at home and at hospital, so we can have this continuum of care when the patient is at home and the clinician is at hospital and how this can be expanded in the community and this is of course with technology but also I mean in architecture we have the equivalent how we can design our communities that can promote a good relationship of patient and doctor in the hospital a good treatment in the hospital and this efficiency to go at home and be able for the person to have care at home with the help of technology and adapted environments, adapted not only technologically, but also low tech. And at the same time, this continue to be able to continue in spaces that are uh, public spaces, like with urban health. And these spaces are supporting uh, and maintaining good health and prevention. So, and for us also technology. So, so these two models actually that we see them separated and as I see medical architecture has not invested so much in technology as it should, could come together and provide this continuum together. And here I come to Charlie, I think I was overpowering and <laughs> did not 
allowed for much interruption or maybe the technology would, did not allow Charlie to interrupt me. But here I would bring Charlie in the discussion because this is one of his pictures. And yeah. eh, Charlie, could yeah. you tell yeah. us more about it? Yeah, sure. Um, well, as um, um, as uh, Evangelia's um, um, student at, at University College in the uh, MSC Healthcare facility, um, this year um, um, I pointed out like what Leah just said about um, uh, a therapeutic environment, like um, how to uh, we 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 study how to create a kind of um, healing environment to turn the building not only to be a building but also a part of the process of the treatment um so i think that's very interesting and my focus is how to um how to connect this kind of a theory to 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 to, to the current technology especially the digital technology um well um this is a picture this is a picture this is a picture i personally experienced uh once um uh in, in in during a telemedicine consultation and uh i was very curious how this new um uh, clinical uh, model is going to affect the um our physical environment like um the consultation room and this is actually how i how i see these things um as you can see from the screens um in the in the left top corner that's my that's me myself and you can see that uh, the doctors um, um, is um, is sitting in front of the screen, in front of the webcam, and you can see that um, yeah, I, I feel that the, the whole uh, you know internet connection stability and the sound quality is very good, but I don't feel very uh, pleasant when I look at the um, when when I look at the screen. Uh, and we, it, it actually from, um, somehow affect my personal, uh, you know, uh, the whole treatment or consultation experience. As you can see, um, the pick the for example, um, there is there is overexposure because of the window in the, at, at the back. As you can see, the circle, uh, right circle on the top, and the the whole background is in a mask, which is not very pleasant to look, and the. the uh, and the doctor was uh, we we could we could the doctor's face the face of the doctor was not positioned in the middle in the center of the uh, screen and sometimes there is evidence to show that um, it will cause misunderstanding uh, about people's facial experience uh, fa facial ex expression when you uh, don't see them I I uh, straightly so. All of this affect the user experience or the um, whole consultation experience, and um, and actually these factors relates a lot to the uh, physical environment. Uh, for example, in the future, in this kind of uh, facilities, it will be more advisable to to have indirect lighting system, and to have more organized background, and to have a proper uh, interactions were um, layout in terms of the equipment and the and and, and the doctors, um, and furthermore, you can um, you can decorate your background and to create better um, you know visual experience for the patient, and um, I believe there is a lot of things um, need to be done in this field. Yeah, well, um, what do you think, Lee? <laughs> yes, first of all, I wanted to make an introduction, a small introduction to your work because we don't have much time. So technically, yeah. uh, Charlie, uh, you looked at the spaces for telehealth, the physical spaces, the telehealth. And yeah. so you, and you looked at the different examples, but also you had some uh, autoethnographic sessions so you could Feel what is a, a telemedicine session with the view of a medical architect. But also you did something very interesting that I, I would like to explain to our audience very, very briefly. Sure. It is that you interviewed architects, several well-known architects and established in the field of medical architecture on how they think telemedicine is important for their practice. 
how it should affect the design. So what were your main conclusions in a nutshell, very, very briefly? Uh, well, they just think that the technology uh, or digital technology is very, might be very crucial in their future works, but it has barely no uh, you know, influence to their daily current daily works. Yeah, that's the fact. So in a sense that the, the design of the hospital in relation to telemedicine is not something that it should be the job of the architect. But obviously, from what you are saying today, you, you, you support the opposite. And as a user experience telemedicine, you support that design matters. But at the same time, they also, they, they also consider that they will have major changes in terms of layout and how hospitals will change, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so it's not that the design, they need to invest in design for telemedicine, which I mean, I don't support and your research does not support that either, but also that it's more uh, the configuration of the hospital would, would change because some machines would be bigger, some machines would be obsolete and would free space and things like that, or some machines will be very, very small. So in that sense, it was only the configuration that people in the, in the industry consider important. However, we argue that we should be more open and we should think the technology as an area that the design should invest, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. And then I would move to one of the Maggi centers that we visited together. And I would like your opinion on that. And so first of all, how do you feel of the space of the Maggi center as a designer? Oh, I think it's a very pleasant space uh, with very, um, it's, it's a typical uh, therapeutics uh, environment for the patient. As you can see, uh, no matter from the, uh, the, the, the facade or in the, or if you experience the, um, the space inside, you can feel the um, some detailed design, some um, some some cozy materials like like the bamboo or the wood. Um, the, 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 you can see that this building used a lot of uh, mm -hmm. um, you know natural materials, which could um, help patient to relax. And also, it, uh, this building have a roof garden where where mm -hmm. the patient could um, have a very uh, relaxable moment. And also, you, you can you can see that uh, in the in the right pictures, you can see a lot of uh, social activity space corner um, mm -hmm. where people could have uh, different kind of interactions with each other. And um, how do you think how do you think this space would operate during COVID in, or in the COVID and post COVID period? How useful would be this Mangi Center, this particular Mangi Center, for the patients? Uh, I think it will not be uh, used as ex expected due to the restrictions of uh, uh, people people numbers restrictions during the COVID period, and um, I don't feel there's too much uh, related um, you know sol solution, especially technological solutions in that. Yeah. So, so and what would you propose? As I mean, because an architect is also a problem so what, what do you think the magic centers uh, could do for example in order to become relevant again because we have like as we said one of the best examples that we have in medical architecture and because yeah. of circumstances they are unused spaces so how could we change that well i think i think some um well personally i'm um, both practical and um, and i'm a researcher uh, in the memo so I, I think I will not be uh, restricted only in the pure architectural design um, perspective. So um, if I, um, if, uh, if I, so my, my thinking is, I think um, the center could um, help to develop more or invest more in their digital platform and help to um, think about a way to try to uh, move those activities uh, offline to online, and in, by the meantime, um, fully utilize its current resources like its beautiful interior, uh, its beautiful um, you know public act activity space, and um, when uh, and, and for example, they could set up a, a video conference or video activities inside of inside of this building. 
and the background could be the you know the the, the beautiful wheels inside of the building and um, um and in this way they could um do some um teleconsultation or uh some um you know online activities to uh, unite the patients trying to give their uh, give them more uh, mentally support and um and but in and no matter in which way i think the uh, the current beautiful wheel inside is a great asset uh, and this asset could be uh you utilize in in the digital conference or the in the uh telemedicine consultation yeah so so what i i understand is i mean from your perspective but also i don't disagree with you is that healthcare buildings they cannot afford to be only low tech anymore and they have to have their also digital aspect and why not their digital twin for example where patients can do things in on site but they can do things remotely and they can yeah. still have the services both yeah. ways if allowed and also for example what uh, engage with a wider audience because again for example even before covid a lot of patients did not have access to a magic center simply because it was a, it was far away but th these are solutions digital solutions and we have seen the paradigm of uh, healthcare architecture how it moves from the hospital to the community and engages in a holistic way, but also the example of digital health that starts from the doctor center and expands to the whole community with a series of apps. Hmm? Yeah. So this is from me and Charlie for today. I would like to thank you and stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much, Leah and Charlie. I, I personally found that really interesting and especially I guess in the time of COVID as well, the sense of space and place about um, how we interact with people in the hospital is, is greater than more than ever in a way. And we've had a question on Slido, a really interesting point about the backgrounds and the video consultations. I'm sure there's a few um, participants on here today who are partaking in a number of video con consultations. Um, with, in terms of the therapeutic relationships, uh, is there any recommendations of what backgrounds you would personally use? I know that Charlie, you then recommended the background of that beautiful um, hospital wall, but in general, um, maybe some of our hospitals aren't as beautiful as that yet. Uh, what type of background would you recommend? Should I say, Leah? Yes, 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 please. Oh, okay. okay. Um, uh, well, first of all, there's um, um, ideally, ideally it should be um, no distractions on the back on the, in the background and it should be as tidy as as possible and uh, the background it, it, uh, it is it is not advisable to include the windows uh, in, in, in within the background because that will uh, usually cause the overexposure of the webcam and ideally uh, you will uh, uh, you, it is advisable to use uh, like the light blue or pre um, Pretty blue a color as the as the wall color because it will uh it's beneficial it's beneficial um I mean there's a there's a, um, a lot of uh, evidence to support this kind of uh, uh, you know at, at once and um um and uh, and other things because uh, during a uh, consultation uh, sound quality is also very important. So if you could put some acoustic material as the, uh, you know, decorations on the wall, that would be more helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And um, just if anyone else has any questions, feel free to um, type them in or pop your hand up. Um, it was interesting to hear that architects don't necessarily feel, if I understood this correctly, that they had a role in the technology, technology design around the hospital. Do you think that's something we might then see a lot more um, just open spaces being designed in hospitals that allow for a lot more change within like internal change uh, to allow for this? Or do you think, uh, or how do you see that um, 
architecture then going forward to allow for the, you know, the technology changes a lot faster than the buildings can necessarily change. So how do we deal with that? I think, I think in general, yes, technology changes very fast and, but hospital buildings, they tend to be a work on progress all the time and they adapt and change and uh, they try. I think it's not a, a matter of reality if architecture could help I think architecture could help a lot, not only at the hospital cell, how it can facilitate technology, but also on the, so on aspects of, let's say now with COVID, I will bring the example of COVID. We had suddenly, before the pub closed, before there was the first thing that closed were the GP practices. So patients, they didn't have access to their GP. And then the GP familiarized himself or herself with the digital technology. And then we had consultations with the GP being at home and the patient being at home. And then everything that we thought about privacy all these years, it was out of the window. So if the patient was talking and the GP had it and the family was in the same room and could hear everything. So for example, our environments, they need to be able to provide for everything that hospital architecture advocates, like uh, good aesthetics, functional lighting, access to daylight, and for example, privacy, not only at the practice, but also at home and at the patient's home. So these are considerations that the architects can have a significant role, but also it could have at the interface of technology, like where, as Charlie said, where do we place this technology? If you place your laptop on the right, height, for example, or in a place with the right light. And finally, the, the last example, how we can interact with the interface of technology itself. So for example, the digital space, like the space that now we are talking, it's also a space. And we leave it to people that are computer experts, but are not experts of aesthetics and of the human computer interaction in terms of materiality and, and space. So this is another field that architects and designers could play a very important role. So it's the, the space of the society, the space of the clinic itself, and the, the digital space. I mean, even if architects don't accept that, I, I think we will grow there. And this is what we are trying to do at the Bartlett. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you so much, um, Charlie and Leo. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll see a change in how we are uh, um, uh, uh, in these spaces definitely in the future. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.